I will now call the committee of the whole meeting of Monday, May 8th, 2023 to order and ask that you turn your cell phones off for the duration of the meeting. I will also ask that when members aren't speaking, they turn their microphones off so we don't experience any feedback. I would like to call for declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act with respect to the agenda for this meeting. Okay, hearing none. I would like to begin by acknowledging with respect that we are in Treaty 3 territory and that the land on which we are gathered is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Métis people. So tonight we have no delegations. We have no presentations, but we have one public notice, which I'll ask the clerk to review now. Thank you. This notice advises the public that council intends to declare the properties located at 26, 28, 31, and 33 Swanson Street as surplus to the municipality's requirements at the May 23rd meeting of council so that it may be sold. This comes from a report presented at the April council meeting by the city's economic development. Thank you. We have no committee and board reports from members of council this evening. And I will would like to ask Mr. Lansdell Roll to present his staff reports. Uh, thank you and through the chair. My first staff report this evening uh, relates to uh, facility naming rights. And the recommendation is that council provide direction to staff on whether we should pursue selling the naming rights of municipal owned assets. Uh, naming rights refer to a type of business deal in which a company pays for the right to name a facility or to name an asset uh, within a facility, typically for a defined period of time. Um, this entails the name only. Uh, it's not, it, there's no um, <clears throat> ownership in the asset in and of itself uh, or the operations within those, those uh, facilities. Uh, naming rights agreements uh, could provide the city with an alternate alternative revenue source uh, which can be used to fund the operations and maintenance of those facilities. Uh, traditionally, uh, I'm sure most are aware of naming rights agreements in larger municipalities throughout Ontario and Canada. For example, you know, the Winnipeg Jets play out of the Canada Life Centre, Canada Life being the organization that paid for those naming rights. The Ottawa Senators uh, Arena is the Canadian Tire Centre. Toronto Maple Leafs play out of the Scotiabank Arena. <clears throat> but with uh, Kenora recently announcing naming rights agreements on three of their facilities, um, it triggered conversations locally about whether or not this is something that the city of Dryden should consider. So um, staff had conversations at the uh, most recent finance committee meeting and the finance committee uh, supported bringing uh, this possibility to, to council for consideration. Um, if council supports this revenue generating strategy or, or program, um, we would have to determine what facilities or assets uh, that we would want to potentially offer naming rights to. In my staff report, I listed the Dryden Memorial Arena, the Dryden Pool and Fitness Center, Milestone Rink, the Dryden Soccer Facility and Sandy, Be Sandy Beach Baseball Diamonds as possibilities. Um, we would also have to create a policy that would uh, guide and direct us. Um, and then we would have to implement the uh, tender or uh, RFP uh, for naming rights sponsorships. I did note some factors to be uh, to, for council to be aware of. Um, so obviously, you know, what major centers uh, receive in naming rights agreements or even what the city of Kenora has received um, provides us with a, you know, uh, a reference point, um, but Dryden's uh, situation would be different than other jurisdictions. And so um, I, th I think if we go to RFP, basically the proposals would uh, dictate what uh, kind of revenue uh, generation uh, possibilities would be there. But really, I don't know if council has any questions, but uh, uh, really what we're looking for this evening is some direction on whether this is something that we should pursue. Thank you, Mr. Lancel. Roll, um, councillors. I see 
Councillor Latham, you have a question or comment? Um, just a comment, uh, like the um, just the one like the Dryden Arena, it has two sheets of ice. One is called the Pronger Rink. Um, and I believe Milestone Rink too has, but anyway, uh, how does that affect those names that are there now? And the actual arena is called the Memorial Arena. And that was uh, in dedication to the uh, uh, armed forces or something like that, eh, Marty? Yeah. Yep, so it ba basically any facilities that currently have a name, Milestone Rink, Memorial Arena, the Pronger Rink, um, you know, if 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 council is is uh, wanting staff to pursue this, we would we would determine which ones we actually want to, um, if any, um, have naming rights or pursue naming rights agreements with you know potential proponents. Um, but if there's anything that uh, council doesn't want to touch due to historical names, then then we wouldn't pursue those. But right now, right now, there's not there's no agreements in place that restrict the municipality from naming any of our having naming rights agreements on any of our facilities. Excellent. I have a question for you. Um, so mostly, I mean, it starts off with a comment, so I'm hesitant with this, uh, this innovative and, and fun revenue opportunity. Um, but I do really think that we would need an airtight policy or procedure to ensure um, that the businesses who pay are outstanding in our community already. Uh, I fear that putting a price on um, the naming rights um, or a bidding opportunity out in the open will only encourage folks who will pay the most. I think we really need to consider their contribution and reputation in our community first before handing rights over for however long. So a question to consider is how do we ensure that applicants aren't problematic or controversial? So I had an example of like, what if, you know, NWMO bought the rights to name the Skywalk or something? Um, how do we ensure that, I guess, like, that we can vet properly who is going to be paying for these naming rights and how how will it not turn into oh we're just going to accept the most money that's a real that's a really good point councillor keevening and i think that the key would be as you said having it built within our policy but also um being very clear in the uh tendering document or the rfp document that the highest proponent um, may or may not be the uh, the one that's selected. So I think a key thing in some of the policies that do exist already that I've read um, within within the province of Ontario, uh, usually there's wording in there that it lines with the municipality's strategic plan or or priorities and vision. Um, there there's uh, you know often you um, um, there's something that it. A requirement that it's a, a local business like within the municipal boundary i don't know if that's necessarily the case that we would want to pursue but um if this is if the majority of council wants us to go down this road like i said the first step would be determining what facilities and the next step would be getting that policy developed and that policy would be approved by council and then after we have that policy in place and and all of those control mechanisms could be built into the policy and uh and then we would uh issue the the tender or the RFP and and it's there's nothing there you know this is somewhat innovative especially in in the north and northwestern Ontario or also innovative for smaller municipalities so nothing may we may do we may go down this road and we may not get any proponents um that that has to be something that we we're mindful of that uh this is something that uh we we could pursue but it may not be successful Councillor Latham. Uh, just one more question. I, I I support the idea, but I, I would say it under the kind of that you do a deep dive into the existing names and see if we have any obligations with those existing names uh, or whether it's just that's what it was called. And I wouldn't want to 
hurt anybody in the community that that got named after. That if you're seeing my point, absolutely, Latham. I I 100% agree. My the list that I put forward is just a list of possibilities. It's not an inclusive list. It's um and it's not anything that I'm saying that this is what I'm recommending that we pursue. But definitely, we should do a deep dive and make sure that there. I know for a fact there's no agreements in place, but there may have been verbal or written commitments. And uh, we would want to make sure that uh, we honor those commitments. Thank you. Councillor Tardif. I think it's a great idea. And um, I recently spoke with one of the proponents in Kenora, uh, whose name is on the arena now or going on the arena. And for them, it's a sense of pride in their community. It's an opportunity to give back in a meaningful way to the community. and. Uh, it makes uh, something for their employees to be proud of when they see the name on there as well. Uh, and I, but I think to your comment on judging who we would allow, we'd be very careful when we say we're going to judge a business on their merit and say who's acceptable or not. Fair enough. Uh, that brings me to another question I have. Um, so to me, this sounds um, like a like an operations thing. So uh, would we? have any input on who is chosen or is that all operational? Oh, Mr. Nesbitt, go ahead. Through the chair, I'm gonna answer your question, Councillor Keevening. This would be a decision at, at council level. This would not be an operational decision. So um, if if council, uh, you direct staff to go forward with this, uh, we would, uh, you know, we would issue that, that RFP and, and uh, you know, pull together all the proposals uh, we could make a recommendation to council, but at the end of the day, council would be making this decision. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay. We need action on this one. Okay. Uh, so can we, is everyone in agreement to kind of move forward and see where it goes? Excellent. Okay. Sounds good. So yes, um, Mr. Lansdell Roll, can you bring that to our next council meeting, please? Yeah. So it probably won't be the next council meeting because what we'll be doing is we'll be doing that deeper dive into the existing names of some of our facilities. Uh, and we'll also be drafting a policy that we can bring forward to council. So it's probably going to be like, you know, in, in a in a couple of months before we're we're able to get to the point to bring more information to council. And then the way I envision it is that council would then approve the facilities that we want to move forward on, and they would also approve the policy before we issue the RFP. Excellent. Take all the time you need. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> all right, I'll move on to my next staff report, which is an amendment to the 2023 uh, budget. And the recommendation is that council approves this, this amendment. Um, basically, the only change that I'm recommending is a change to our capital plan. Um, within our wastewater treatment plant, um, based on uh, already approved and actioned uh, capital project for 2023, it was identified, and this is, I am not the technical water or wastewater treatment plant operator expert to be speaking on this. However, um, in general, the air diffusers I'm going to say aerate the wastewater um, and it was identified that they had broke in one of the tanks they had broken free i provided an image or a couple images for in the staff report the first image is what they're supposed to look like so you can see those circles all in a line those are the air diffusers in the second uh, image you can kind of see that uh, there's a couple of those circles they're a little bit larger but you can see that they're kind of just in the water on a on uh, not a uh, flat level. Anyway, the air diffusers came away, um, causing sewage and sludge to enter the aeration system, which must be cleaned out. So the the tank is currently uh, shut down and drained, with the second tank handling the current flows. Um, and we are going to basically. The facility is nine years old, so we're going to take the opportunity to do some 10-year maintenance activities while the tank is drained. 
But the revised capital plan um, would include this air diffuser project. The budget would be $127,000, and it would be fully funded by a draw from the wastewater reserve fund. So if there are questions, I may defer them to Blake, but, uh, but fire away. Any questions, councillors? I have a question. Um, has this, and, and maybe Mr. Poole, you might be the one to answer. Um, does this have any effect on like service delivery to citizens or any interruptions that they might need to maybe have already been made aware of? No, this has no interruption to the citizens of Dryden here. It's just our plant. Uh, there is potential, I guess, if we get a lot of rain and it enters our sanitary system, we may overflow, but it will not affect any citizens or backup or anything. It would just bypass, which is uh, we have to deal with the Ministry of Environment then. So, But it has happened in the past. Hopefully it doesn't happen now. We have a good spring here so far, so the melt isn't is good and we're able to operate with one tank right now, but that's why we have redundancy in almost everything we have at the water plant and sewage plant. Thanks. Yeah, my understanding, and Blake could probably confirm, if we would have had a spring this year like we had last year, it probably would have been more of an issue for us, but uh, with very limited melt and runoff, it's our treatment plant was able to handle the flows. Okay, so with no further comments, this can be brought to, this one can be brought to our next meeting, correct? Excellent. Everyone's good, yeah. Okay, carry on. All right, my last staff report. Uh, it seems like this is the uh, committee of the whole meeting for me, <laughs> outside of Allison's last uh, staff report here. But anyway, my last staff report is relates to the 2022 year in financial report. Um, this financial report provides uh, the year end of primarily a comparison of budget amounts to actuals uh, for revenues and expenses for operations and capital. Um, I want to note that this is unaudited financial information. Um, so our final uh, operating results will be presented to Council in June after our audit and financial information return. Um, is completed, our financial statements are completed. In summary though, our overall, our revenues were, were slightly lower than budget. They were within one and a half percent. Our expenditures were, were basically on budget, point, within 0.2%. Um, that servicing was on budget, um, but the overall, we, we ended the, the 2022 fiscal year with an, an, a net operating deficit of around $420,000, which is within 1.2% of our operations. The 2022 operating deficit will be allocated as an expense for 2023. So basically, uh, I've, I've communicated this to council before, but I'll just uh, reiterate it. Prior year surpluses become a revenue source in the next fiscal year and prior year deficits become an expense item in the next fiscal year. So we have to fund this expense now in 2023. And so once our audit is completed and our financial statements are completed, um, I'll be bringing forward in June a budget amendment. Um, but I can say that uh, we have a plan on how to address this, this expense. And uh, historically, <clears throat> the reason why we have an operating surplus and deficit policy is so that we have actually an operating reserve that would be the draw whenever we have an, a deficit. And so when we have surpluses, a portion of those surpluses go into that reserve and, and to be used on you know, future years operating deficit. The, the issue that we're having in 2023 is that uh, in 2022, we utilized a significant amount of that reserve for the transition to the OPP. Um, so we're not able to fully fund this 420k expense in 2023 from our operating reserve um, but with uh, uh, some other additional cost savings um, we're able to pull back another line item um, but that will be coming forward in june but basically we have a plan this is not going to result in us changing the taxation level 
It's not going to change our capital plan and it's not going to change any of our operations. Getting into the, uh, the report itself, um, there's a few, few highlighted items that I would like to speak to. The first on the revenue side. So like I said, uh, our operating revenues came in $500,000 under our anticipated levels or budgeted levels. There is a whole vast of positives and negatives within here, but but overall, there's a few negatives that I'll, that I'll, I just wanted to note. The first being the uh, transfer from reserve revenue was $519,000 uh, negative at year end. And this relates to when we transitioned to the OPP, the former DPS members had options of how their disbandment pay or severance pay could be taken. And um, some of them took salary continuance instead of a lump sum. So we didn't need the amount that uh, the budget was based on everybody taking a lump sum, but those on salary continuance um, go into actually this fiscal year. And I believe that there's an individual that will even impact the 2024 budget. So this is a negative on the revenue side, but it's fully offset by a savings on the expense side. So it's a lower, a lower severance or disbandment cost. Uh, and so we didn't need to draw on the reserves in 2022. We will have to still draw the reserve values, but they're going to be spread out over the three fiscal years instead of one. The other item relates to user fee revenue. And um, the majority of our variances were anticipated outside of a handful. So when we did our, our Q3 financial report that was presented in October, um, the majority of these variances, whether their revenues or expenses were anticipated. The one area that we missed was in our user fees. And uh, a lot of that was residual impacts of COVID at our rec center. We did have a, a closure for one month in 2022 for the whole facility. And we also, um, some of our major special events didn't take place and those were built into the budget. On the expense side, like I spoke, one of the major positives were in salary and benefits, and the majority of that relates to the DPS uh, disbandment. But we also had uh, a handful of vacancies throughout the year that, that resulted in those cost savings. Another major item is in the materials and other, and that there's a, a, a whole, <laughs> I listed a whole lot of reasons behind this. And uh, some of them we we factored into our forecast and some of them uh, we missed. But uh, um, the result of missing these in our forecast has caused us to basically be a little bit more mindful and change practices that we're going to be moving forward on so that uh, we're not um, after the fact, you know, caught in a position like this. Normally how we we had historically operated, we we since I've been here in 2016, We've had operating surpluses each and every year. And uh, we usually keep track of items, whether they're savings throughout the year or uh, issues that we need to address throughout the year within operations. And we usually have done historically a pretty good job of tracking that and then making decisions um, on maybe if there's an issue that, that becomes a higher priority that we pull back in another area to, offset, to have it offsetting cost savings so that we're not in an operating deficit. So, you know, our CAO, Roger, and I, we've talked. We've talked to our uh, leadership group. We've talked to our manager management group. And uh, um, I don't foresee an operating deficit in our future again. Maybe I'll just go through the whole thing and then we can. Uh, I'll, I'll take any questions at the very end. With regards to capital, I've gone like I presented a very detailed a listing of all of our capital projects, but overall, um, we plan to spend just under 1.8 million. We ended up spending just over 1.6, so we underspent about 140,000. And I listed basically the projects that uh, um, there's other projects in there that didn't impact this, but I listed the projects that uh, caused the the underspend in capital. And to be honest with you, if we didn't have this underspend in capital. Um, our operating deficit would have been would have been greater. 
but I don't want to take credit for that. That wasn't by design. We we want to spend our <laughs> we want to spend our capital budgets. I do want to spend a little bit of time with regards to our reserves, though. So with regards to reserves and reserve funds, um, reserves, we started 2022 with a million dollars in reserves and just under six point four million dollars in reserve funds. We ended the year with just under one point two million on the reserve side, but now we're we're ended 2022 with under four million on the reserve fund side. And there are 2024 commitments um, utilizing reserve and reserve funds. So 2023 um, is going to even be um, a little bit more tight of a situation. And, and when we're looking at reserves overall, um, we have specific targets that are built into our policy. And, and when I look at total discretionary reserve funds, so these are our discretionary reserve funds, excluding the water works and sanitary wastewater reserve funds. Our target is 50% of property tax revenue. So for 2022, that equates to 7.3 million and we're at 4.6. So as you can see, we are uh, quite, we are millions under our targeted levels. With regards to waterworks, the water waterworks reserve fund target is 100% of waterworks own source revenue. For 2022, that works out to be 2.5 million and we're at 600,000. So we're $1.9 million short from that target. Sanitary and wastewater reserve fund, that target in our in our policy is 50% of the sanitary wastewater own source revenues. For 2022, that equates to 1.3 million. We're at 300,000, so we're 1 million short of, of that target. And then our general operating reserve, the target in our policy says two months payroll expense, expenditures. So that equates to 1.9 million. We're at 800,000, so it's $1.1 million shortfall. So we're not very we're not very close to our targets, and with our commitments in 2023, um, we're moving in the wrong direction. So um, it's something for council to be mindful of that uh, these reserve and reserve funds give us flexibility and opportunities to take advantage of external sources of funds when they present themselves, and when we don't have those funds, it puts us in a very difficult position. Well, if council has any questions, I can take them now. Councillors, any questions? I have one. Oh, Mr. McKinnon. Councillor McKinnon. So our auditor is firmly aware that we're going to meet our filing deadlines this year, right? May 31st? That's correct. Thank you. I have a question. It's about debt. Um, looking at the chart on whatever page that was, page seven or 21 of 69, um, does this uh, graph mean that our debt is going to be completely paid off at this point, looking at this thing by 2030? Or, or if I'm missing it, what does this graph mean? mean for our debt sorry councillor evening i passed over debt because you know usually this is something that we're very mindful of but you know since 2021 we've been in a much better position so yes i apologize for glossing over this and you are correct that our current debt will be fully paid off at the end of 20, 2030 assuming that we don't take any more on from this point until then And just, just for comment on debt, um, 2020, our debt payments uh, or debt servicing costs were over $3 million, and now they're just over a million. So uh, we're in a much better position today than we were, uh, you know, in the 20, from 2012 to 20, or 2013 to 2020. Yes, I agree. It looks, it looks good, and I'm excited for it to be gone. Uh, so seeing no other comments from councillors, this is great. And we can bring this to, no. No, this is just oh, for information and uh, we'll, we'll, post, we'll post it on okay. the city's website for uh, citizens and 
uh, interested parties to to read and go through. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so next is I would like to ask uh, Madam Chair to present her staff report, please. If I were the chair, that would be great too. But oh, why don't I play the clerk role tonight? Yeah, go ahead. Cool. Thank you. You can be the chair. Okay, so <laughs> uh, my report this evening follows up on the one I had uh, presented at the March Council meeting uh, regarding the possibility of amending Council's procedural bylaw to remove the references to Committee of the Whole meetings and to have two Council meetings a month rather than the one Committee of the Whole and the Council meeting. At that meeting, Council had asked that I prepare, prepare a draft procedural bylaw indicating proposed changes and bring it to this evening's meeting. Since then, we've uh, revised the procedural bylaw to remove uh, references to Committee of the Whole. And I've also proposed a change to Section 4.2 uh, that says in December we'll just have the one council meeting on the second meeting, uh, second Monday of the month, rather than uh, the two council meetings. Uh, putting that information into the procedural bylaw will uh, alleviate the need for me to present a report each year in February to amend the December meeting schedule. And if council concurs with that change, it would be included in the amended procedural bylaw. Uh, if council is interested in going with, forward with the revised bylaw, uh, an amending bylaw could be brought forward to the May 23rd council meeting. However, as noted in my report, there are updates that would have to be made in the back end of the computer system once the bylaw has been adopted. And so since some people may have already submitted uh, reports for the June committee of the whole meeting by the time we meet at the end of May. We would leave the June schedule as a committee of the whole and council meeting and the changes to the bylaw would take effect at the end of June so that in July we would move forward with two council meetings, first on the 10th and the second on the 24th of July. Now if I haven't confused you all completely, uh, if I have, I've I'm open for questions. If not, I'm amazed. Any questions? Wow. Get ready to be amazed. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Counselor. <laughs> okay, then if you're all happy with that, we'll move forward with the bylaw on the 23rd of May. Yes, please. Yep, that sounds good. So we have no notices of motion this evening and we can go right into announcements so are there any counselors who have any comments regarding any announcements coming up i don't see any i've got uh i just want to let people know that the community table is always looking for volunteers and if you are interested, Tuesday and Wednesday from 4 to 6, they are serving hot meals to anyone in the community. Um, and they would love to have us come volunteer. So if you are interested, I will probably send out some sort of email about it. Um, and then I need to request our clerk to ask for someone to move and second the motion to adjourn tonight. Sorry, Councillor Noel, I didn't even see your hand go up. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to mention that uh, Madam Chair and I attended on Saturday, the last or Sunday, the last day of the smile cookies that was run by Tim Hortons, and we had a great, great deal of fun. And I wanted to mention a special acknowledgement of appreciation to the Tim Hortons franchise and to the owners, Keith and Laura Cor Corbell, who uh, provided the space in their store. Lots of other support. And note that all the money that was raised over that period went locally here to to two charities here. So it's uh, really a positive thing for our community. The other thing that I wanted to mention is just by chance, my partner and I went for lunch the other day down at the end of Van Horn where the new benches are. And uh, I'd sort of been oblivious to them until we actually sat there and ate some chip box fries with some of the local seagulls. We both remarked how nice this new addition was, and, I, and I'm really hoping that we have the opportunity to develop that space better than 
know, to make more improvements on it. It's so nice to go down there. So I encourage everyone to go check that out with or without chip box fries. Yeah. You should acknowledge actually today that Mr. Shepard, the founder of the chip box, uh, apparently passed away either today or yesterday. So sadly, a uh, great member of our community and a heck of a nice fella. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Noel. I'm triple checking that no one else says anything. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, yes, we, um, Madam Clerk, can you ask for someone to move and second the motion to adjourn? Councillor Noel and Councillor McKinnon, thank you. Moved by Councillor Noel, seconded by Councillor uh, McKinnon that this meeting be declared adjourned. All in favor? Excellent, carried. This meeting stands adjourned. Please turn off your mics.